All right, welcome everyone. We have a few uh, housekeeping items before we start. First, um, if you were, if you just joined, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We're always glad to hear where people are coming, um, zooming in from. Um, welcome, happy Open Education Week. My name is Nancy Henke. I am the textbook affordability librarian at the University of Northern Colorado, and I'm thrilled that you're all here today. Um, before we begin, I have a few items that I want to attend to very briefly. Um, first, uh, please do note that today's session will be recorded. So please just do keep that in mind when you're choosing how you participate in today's session. The recording um, will be made available um, on in UNC Open, the University of Northern Colorado's um, institutional repository and through the Colorado OER Higher Ed Hub on OER Commons. And the link will be sent to uh, registrants when it's available. Uh, but please also know that because we are committed to accessibility, um, the recording won't be immediately available so that we can ensure that the video and the transcript are accessible to all users. And simply due to staffing, this may take several weeks. So we appreciate your patience. Um, some other things to know, we have enabled uh, both the Q&A feature and the chat feature for today's session. Um, the Q&A is meant for questions directly for our speaker, which he'll have a chance to address at the end of his talk. Um, the chat is intended for attendees to introduce themselves and engage with each other. Um, but please try to avoid putting questions for our speaker directly in the chat because they just simply may be inadvertently overlooked when we um, get to the discussion portion of our, um, of our uh, talk today. Some other things, I have some gratitude that I wanna share. First, I want to express my appreciation to the UNC AOER committee um, and especially the events and promotions subcommittee, as well as members of the administrative team at the university libraries. Um, all of our open education week events um, require work that is not seen by those who attend, but is still absolutely vital for making it happen. And I am very grateful for everyone's contributions. Um, I also want to send a thank you to the Colorado Department of Higher Education, who has supported this event in multiple ways. And without it, um, it would not have happened. So we express our gratitude there as well. And finally, thank you to all of our attendees. Um, there are always going to be many obligations on people's time. And if you are an open education practitioner, those multiply during open education week. So you're making a commitment to our field by being here. And we appreciate your attendance. Next, I want to address the University of Northern Colorado's land acknowledgement. Um, the University of Northern Colorado occupies the lands in the territories of the Ute, Cheyenne, Lakota, and Arapaho peoples. The university acknowledges the 48 tribes that are historically tied to the state of Colorado. Thus, the land on which UNC is situated is tied to the history and culture of our native and indigenous peoples. UNC appreciates this connection and has great respect for this land. Additionally, the university community pays its respects to elders past, present, and future, and those who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. And finally, um, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Rajiv Janjiani serves as the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning at Brock University. He is affiliated with the Social Justice Research Institute and the Social Justice and Equity Studies MA program and leads the Brock University Inclusive Education Research Lab. His research focuses on open educational practices, inclusive teaching, and ethical approaches to educational technology, and he currently serves on the board of directors of Open Education Global, the organization that began Open Education Week in 2013. Earlier in his career, he led the development of Canada's first zero textbook cost degree program, was invited to speak at the United Nations about how open education supports UN sustainable development goals, co-edited two volumes on open education, co-authored three textbooks in psychology, and has received numerous teaching and leadership awards. He is also husband to an amazing scholar, Dr. Sarita Janjiani, the father of two remarkable boys, has two cats named Lucky and Layla, and perhaps most impressive, he enjoys playing tennis and ukulele simultaneously. It's amazing, you've got to see it. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Dr. Rajiv Janjiani. Thank you so much, Nancy, for that very, very sweet introduction. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try and play with my buttons over here to bring up my presentation as, as I'm starting to speak as well. So bear with me. 
Um, but as I do this, there we go. Hopefully it is coming through well. Uh, I do want to echo what Nancy said. I really appreciate you taking your time out of your schedule to be here today. Um, it, it means a lot. And I see, I, I see people from all over the continent, certainly from all the way from Saskatchewan down to Texas, including some, some good friends like the incredible champion that is Kathy Germano from New York. Uh, so thank you for being here. And thank you also to the Affordable and OER committee at uh, UNCO for the invitation. Uh, it really, it means a lot to be able to kick off Open Education Week with such a wonderful supportive community, and especially, especially one that uh, I'm certainly drawing inspiration from as well as I've been following your work and learning from it. Um, before I begin, I do want to as well uh, recognize that I'm coming to you today from the west coast of Canada, British Columbia, uh, and specifically the traditional ancestral and unceded, it was never ceded through a, ter through a treaty, for example, the territory of the Squamish First Nation. Uh, very privileged to uh, live, work, and play over here and raise uh, our children, of course, as well. Uh, as uh, Nancy said, uh, uh, there'll be the Q&A feature for the, for the official questions, but I am going to try and leave the chat open as well, just to get a sense of uh, the tone of, of how things are going and if there are areas of interest to you as well. So I'm going to do my best, folks. Um, but I do want to first start by setting a little bit of a tone as well. And I, and I say this because, you know, Open Education Week is a global celebration. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming we're all here because we care deeply and perhaps personally about equitable access. Uh, and I can tell you uh, my own personal story at some point as well about how, you know, this this work matters so much to me because it is personal, uh, right? I have this idea that education is uh, a tool for economic and social mobility, that it can unlock human potential. It's not a theoretical construct for me, certainly, uh, coming to North America as an international student dealing with food insecurity uh, along the way. So uh, I want to be quite transparent about certainly my politics, uh, which I imagine are not terribly different from those of you who are celebrating Open Education Week. And so I'm going to call on the words of the incomparable Bell Hooks over here uh, by sharing that my commitment to engaged pedagogy is also similarly an expression of political activism. Uh, and in many ways, I'll point to very specific parts of this uh, along the way. One element of what I mean when I talk about this uh, is, of course, the United Nations Declaration of Universal Human Rights, uh, and specifically Article 26 that speaks to the importance of equitable access and that higher education should be accessible to all as a universal human right. And yet, I confess, the more that I've over the over the over the years that I've been doing this work, the more that I study higher education and even work as an academic administrator from within the system, the more I can see the many ways, sometimes blunt, sometimes obvious, sometimes very subtle, that higher education actually replicates and reinforces even if sometimes inadvertently, existing societal power hierarchies. If you look at the work of the brilliant Tressie McMillan Cotton in her book, uh, Lower Ed, for example, she makes a powerful case for how education and college education in particular has moved from being uh, a, a collective good that benefits society to much more of an individual good. And so far from being a universal human right, education and it, indeed higher education in North America, and I can point to the United States in particular, but Canada is not immune over here. It's increasingly becoming an individual privilege rather than a universal right. Now, I want to point to some specifics over here. And of course, those of you in Colorado in particular, I have in mind when I'm talking about this, but really the data are not terribly different uh, across the country. Uh, but just to give you a sense, since 1980, for example, the proportion of total education revenue at public institutions in the US that comes from net tuition revenue has effectively doubled, right? So this means that, that students across the US over the years have been picking up a greater and greater share of the tab for higher education. And I'm sorry to say that in Colorado, the burden is shouldered by students to an even greater degree. Uh, so if we look at over here, you'll see in 1980, it was about 37 percent. That was already a bit higher than the U.S. average. And at this point, it's approaching two thirds of the total cost. It's interesting to look at these changes and when they took place, and it probably won't surprise people to, to learn that in many states, Colorado included, there was a bit of a crossover uh, in the mid noughts uh, around the time of the Great Recession, for example. And so it's around that time where students began paying a greater share uh, of uh, the cost of higher education than the state. 
And of course, I do want to note that uh, certainly you can see a bit of a trend change right at the end of that graph when it comes to state funding going up. And that continued over the last couple of years where it's risen even more steadily, as you can see in this graph as well. Uh, but of course, one of the challenges of supporting higher education uh, in Colorado uh, and certainly trying to widen equitable access is that Colorado has typically lagged behind the U.S. average when it comes to per FTE or per student uh, state funding or at least appropriations. So there's room for progress, certainly, but here's a bit of a snapshot in terms of where things are at at the moment. One of the scholars whose work I certainly have drawn on quite a bit over the last decade, uh, even though she's no longer at Temple University, uh, is Sarah goldrick Rab. And this is one of the books that I, I certainly learned a great deal from, particularly when it comes to the raw cost of college in the United States, and in particular, the issue of food insecurity. So if you haven't read this book, I certainly do recommend it. It lays bare how difficult the, the American dream is in reality at this point. Certainly for those of us who are educators within the system at this point, the forces that are facing students today are quite different than what it was when many of us were undergraduates. Sarah used to lead the Hope Center uh, at Temple University. And so I wanna to point to some of their more recent research uh, which includes this large uh, survey um, published in 2021. This included the responses from uh, almost 200,000 students from about 130 two-year colleges and 72 four-year colleges and universities across the United States. This includes, for example, Colorado State University, although not UNCO. I uh, certainly think that there's a lot to draw on that will be similar. But the essence of this report indicates that nearly three in five students across the US are experiencing basic needs insecurity. And that includes 48% of respondents overall who experience housing insecurity and about 29% of respondents at four-year institutions who experience food insecurity. So I wanna talk about food insecurity just a bit because of course, this is an issue certainly on my campus as well in Niagara in Ontario, so I'm going backwards over here, uh, but it's certainly an issue as well at UNCO. For example, I read that there was a survey uh, last year and about uh, 602 UNCO uh, students were surveyed uh, and about half of them, nearly half of them said that they experienced food insecurity. Uh, many of the, those attending or engaging in this talk after in the recording as well will know that the Bear Pantry on campus provides food and non-perishable items Monday through Thursday, uh, and people can collect seven items during each weekly visit. So of course it is limited, it's not open every day, but even with those constraints, the pantry recorded nearly 3,000 visits by about 821 people from July to November last year. And so there is, of course, greater demand than there is supply. And over the next year, in fact, they will be moving to a larger space, I understand, uh, to include things like food processing spaces and more refrigeration. So I encourage you to, to look at ways to support this important initiative, particularly for students who are literally having to choose between groceries and, of course, things like textbooks. I mean, I'm mentioning this because, you know, groceries and textbooks often come up in the same discussion uh, for a few reasons. I mean, one of the reasons is, I think, if you're an educator in higher education, you know that at the start of every semester, or perhaps just before it, there is this chorus of emails that we all tend to receive, right? Hey, prof, do I really need the book? Hey, prof, do I, may I use an older edition, for example? And what, and food insecurity is one of the things that lurks behind those emails, of course. But there's a few other reasons why. I mean, one of the reasons why textbooks are worth talking about in this broader issue of affordability and access in higher education is that there's really not much else that has risen quite so much when it comes to costs as, as college textbooks have. Here's a graph from Colorado's own Jonathan Poritz, um, who of course uh, is, 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 has moved out since, but did incredible work in the state. Uh, and it shows just how much textbook costs rose uh, relative to inflation since 1980. And you can look through these data if you like as well. The Bureau of Labor Statistics provides this information as well. It's been quite startling. And typically, certainly until about 2018, didn't really matter what five or 10 year period you were looking at. Typically it rose between about three and four times the rate of inflation. There certainly has been a plateauing uh, since about 2018. There's a few reasons for that that I will speak to as well. But I think one of the things that has played into this, of course, is that many faculty members certainly um, uh, in some cases will assign books that they actually don't even know the cost of as well. So I wanted to touch 
on uh, an economic uh, concept known as the principal agent problem, right? Uh, the economists will know this already, but typically when you have an individual who's making a decision that a lot of people are bound by, but the individual themselves is not facing the consequences of that decision, that gap creates a bit of a challenge. Uh, and so as a student has said in some research that, uh, that we've done at my home institution, uh, buying a $200 textbook doesn't hurt quite as much as buying a $200 textbook that proves to be useless or unassigned, for example. But I will say that, you know, as an educator, beyond the emails that we receive from students, the other unsolicited uh, uh, packages we receive, of course, tend to be from commercial publishers. Um, I'm certainly accustomed to teaching introductory psychology over many, many years. Uh, and every year there will be a, you know, a new edition with fairly cosmetic changes. Um, and so I do want to point to a business model that has made this issue much, much worse, particularly on the part of commercial publishers. Uh, and I'm going to quote directly over here from the CEO at the time of Cengage, who wrote in 2018 that there are millions of students out there who are making very difficult, uh, very painful trade-offs in the purchase of learning materials relative to paying the rent, paying for basic needs, food, etc. And that we as an industry have chosen for a long time to basically ignore that, he said, or have more or less been paying lip service to them. It's amazing when this is actually said out loud. Nonetheless, what this means, though, is that students often are making this trade-off, right? So students can't easily say or that they're not going to pay tuition. So they, they choose to, to skip buying their textbooks, for example, just as they can't, e uh, just so, they can't so easily say, I'm not going to pay my rent, but they often do, in fact, starve themselves and are faced with food insecurity. So a few parallels over here. The best data we have at the moment in the United States, certainly concerning student textbook access, comes from the state of Florida. And I'm sharing with you the latest version of this. They've run this in 2016 and 2018, uh, but this comes from 2022, uh, where this was uh, about 14,000 responses from students at 30 of Florida's public post-secondary institutions. And as you can see, more than half of them report that they're simply not purchasing required course textbooks due to cost. That's how that sentence ends in the survey. About 43.7 are taking fewer courses, nearly 40% not registering for specific courses, and so on and so on. So this gives you a sense that high textbook costs are affecting students, not just, terms, not just in terms of economics, but in terms of educational outcomes as well, right? None of these are optimal choices. And the sad part is these kinds of choices are disproportionately made by students from marginalized backgrounds, particularly first generation students, students of color uh, and, and others, uh, for example, holding student loans. This of course hits close to home for folks at UNCO as well. And I really want to uh, applaud uh, the the honesty and the bravery of uh, of uh, Ethan Roth. Ethan is a psychology undergraduate student at UNCO. He's a member of the AOER committee and is in fact working for the university library uh, this school year doing projects on behalf of the AOER. Uh, but I do want to call attention to uh, a terrific blog post, uh, really, really revealing, really honest, and as I said, really quite brave. And I'm going to quote over here to illustrate that Ethan is an example of the, of the student who is behind those kinds of choices. So I'm going to quote over here to say that Ethan says, taking classes without required materials is a lot like starting a course halfway through the semester. It feels like every assignment, every lecture is in the middle of a topic that you've never heard of before. Tests are based on topics only covered in the readings. Assignments are on, are on certain chapters. Exams are open book, but only if you have a book to open. This is very, very true. And again, I have to have to uh, appreciate Ethan's work on this, not just in terms of supporting uh, his work through the library and the AOER, but in this kind of public advocacy as well. It means so much uh, to be able to communicate directly to educators like this, right? This is not something that's happening on other campuses. This is not just the case of, well, students these days, if they can afford X, they can afford Y. No, these are real human beings. And we're talking about equitable access over here. So often when you're making a choice about an expensive course textbook, let's say, uh, you are making a choice between uh, you know, something that perhaps 50% or 48% of your students can afford uh, or something that actually is available to everybody from day one. Of course, things have changed quite a bit. And, and not just at UNCO, uh, things have changed across the continent, certainly in terms of a faculty awareness of the problem of textbook costs and the availability of OER as an option. And this was just before the pandemic, where we saw that, you know, if, uh, just over four out of every five faculty members in, in, in the United States agreed that textbooks and course materials cost too much. 
in this survey in Insight Higher Ed. This is one of the things that, that of course, influenced, but it was not the only thing, uh, the rapid increase in the adoption of OER through the pandemic. Right? Digital delivery was, was across the board for, for quite a period of time. And suddenly, I know at my home institution, we were sometimes dealing with international students who were in China behind a, a you know, firewall effectively erected by the government. And we were concerned about what platforms they could access or not, uh, let alone the cost of shipping expensive textbooks overseas, which was untenable for the campus store as well. And so suddenly it was interesting that the use of open educational resources wasn't just supporting access and affordable access and equity. It was actually quite critical in serving international students overseas. And so we saw quite a surge as well through the pandemic in OER adoptions. But to take a step back from OER though, uh, I do wanna say that if you're you know, uh, a rank and file faculty member, and I was for a long time certainly as well, I would often have conversations with those same textbook publisher representatives that would send me those unsolicited packages. And when they visited with me, I would say, you know, I'm really interested in more affordable options over here. And that's when they would typically say things like, well, yes, of course, we are too. That's why we have ebooks, they would say. And ebooks, I really want to be clear, uh, as the image illustrates over here, in my mind are very much uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing, in part because students never buy an ebook, right? They lease it, which means they lose access after 90 days, 120 days, how many ever days it is. There's issues in terms of copying and pasting and accessibility through the digital rights management. Uh, and students, of course, are unable to resell a book uh, at the end of the term. But more to the point, even if they wanted to keep it, they lose access, right? So a student who, let's say, takes anatomy and physiology in first year, wants to go on a med school, keep that book as a reference, is unable to do so. And over the years, the focus on digital textbooks has morphed even further as the business model has gone to something that is often marketed as inclusive access, although sometimes it's also called uh, other things. Sometimes it's called exclusive access. But inclusive access is perhaps more honestly described as automatic textbook billing, uh, as this report from the United States uh, Public Interest Research Group uh, uh, spells out. In this model, every student at the institution potentially is billed a mandatory course materials fee that represents an alleged dis discount of the high water mark of the price of a new hardcover textbook. And this fee, I want to be clear, is still often higher than the average student will actually currently spend because the spectrum of options right now includes everything from purchasing used copies, use of reserve copies at the library, group purchases, the use of older editions, and of course, the many students who go without as well. So it's a bit of a forced model. Um, one of the challenges over here, of course, is that, as I said, with the e-textbooks, students are not purchasing, but they're leasing. So that's one issue. There's the DRM, there's the copying and pasting accessibility issue. But more than this, this model is typically an opt-out model. Uh, typically, the opt-out is under restrictive terms that are not terribly obvious to students. Uh, sometimes they have to locate and complete and submit a form within 10 days, for example, uh, and good luck with that. Uh, but for students who prefer to work with a print copy, you know, whether for accessibility reasons or simply to resell it following the course, the ability to opt out is really important. Uh, but yet the publishers, of course, have a vested interest in keeping the number of students who opt out to a minimum. As you might imagine, this is guaranteed revenue, uh, certainly from every student. And so this is why the opt out terms typically range from restrictive to potentially punitive. Now, it's interesting right now to follow what's happening in this space because in fact, the US federal government is currently pushing back against this opt-out version of inclusive access in favor of a more opt-in model instead. And so I wanna quote from one of, one of the leaders in the space, Nicole Allen from, the, from SPARC, which is known as the Scholarly Publication, uh, Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. Nicole says that if inclusive access is the great deal that many people claim it is, there's actually no reason to believe that students won't continue to do that voluntarily. So again, uh, I would say this is something to watch in this space. Uh, it's, been, it's been fascinating to watch. Uh, this is not the only space this, where this happens. You're seeing this in AI as well right now, right? Where a company puts out a, a tool that hasn't been really carefully vetted or thought through, and they'll follow up a few months later to say, we're gonna sell you the solution to detect the use of our faulty tool. Uh, and so it's really quite fascinating to me uh, that, you know, this is akin to me, uh, inclusive access to, you know, an arsonist effectively selling you a faulty fire extinguisher. Uh, you know, so I have reason to be suspect, let me just say that. And this is one of the reasons why, of course, I care so much about open education.
Because with open education in general and with open educational resources in particular, we're not just talking about resources that are free. The important aspect, the, the, the defining aspect of open educational resources is in fact that they come with a set of freedoms associated with OER. And these are commonly referred to as the five R's. So these are the, the permissions or the rights to freely reuse, revise, remix, retain, and redistribute. So as an educator, of course, you can freely access and reuse these resources in your teaching and learning. You can revise them. And in practical terms, that could mean everything from, you know, in a bigger way, maybe you want to translate it into a different language, but it could mean you want to contextualize it, could mean you want to update it, or at the very least, you want to say, you don't have to tell your students don't read chapter four, take it out. If your discipline like mine, psychology is still bumbling its way through a replicability crisis, you can actually revise some of the canonical findings that are being questioned. You can do all kinds of things with that permission, right? You can move from mapping your course onto the table of contents of a textbook to actually modifying your instructional resources to serve your pedagogical goals. And I would suggest that this is actually an additional layer of academic freedom that has never really been considered worth fighting for. I would suggest it is. But you can remix, right? You can combine two or more OER together in an interesting way, whether it's just embedding openly licensed videos or interactive simulations inside an open textbook or much more. And students can keep this work forever and you can freely redistribute it as well. And of course, textbooks will get most of our attention given what we do in higher education and the typical practice of teaching and learning, certainly in North America. But I do wanna say that OER includes any kind of teaching and learning resources that are released under an open license. So for example, it includes images. If you think about uh, these masterworks that, are, that have been released under the public domain and open, openly available out of the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands, uh, right? This is all openly available, right? This could be considered OER. Uh, uh, and so I, I share this as well as an example because the study of art history is often incredibly expensive with the textbooks in part because of the permissions involved. So images could be OER, right? Videos can be OER. There are many TEDx videos that carry an open license, for example. You don't have to ask for permission to reuse them to support teaching and learning. Colorado, of course, at, at UC Boulder or CU Boulder, I should say, uh, has been incredible with putting out the interactive simulations, the FET simulations. I certainly use them to teach you know, neural transmission, for example, in, in basic psychology courses as well. This is all available. You can download it, put it into your learning management system if you like. Uh, it doesn't require forking over data, for example, or students paying a fee to access high quality resources like this. But you could also look at the use of open platforms, uh, tools like WebWork. I know my university, my former university, and many others uh, across the world use this, right? endorsed by the Mathematical Association of America, but it's used often for, for quizzing, for formative quizzing, or even, even summative quizzing, potentially, uh, in physics and math and other disciplines as well. So you can really look quite far for the types of OER. And of course, with open textbooks, this is one of the main places I typically point people to. The University of Minnesota still hosts the open textbook library, which has over a thousand textbooks at this point. And I'm proud to say one of the books that it includes is one of the books that I had the privilege of working on. Um, and Nancy referenced this in, 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 in the introduction. Uh, but I do wanna say as, a, as an open textbook author, I will tell you firsthand, um, you know, when I first began doing this work, I don't know that I could have anticipated the impact this, this work could have had. Uh, I mean, I remember spending a summer editing and, and uh, localizing this text um, uh, along the way. But even now, oh, I mean, this is about 10 years, more than 10 years later after I began working on this text. As you can see, we're in the fourth edition at this point, and I still receive emails from um, faculty members across the world, but even more powerfully, students from across the world who tell me about the impact of this work. And so uh, at this point, you know, this work has been translated into different languages. There's an addition in, you know, for example, the, the, um, uh, uh, in New York, there's an example in New Zealand, all over the place. And so I think about OER at this point as the gift that keeps giving, but one that actually gets dearer every time it is re-gifted, because it's benefiting from the intellectual labor of everybody who's touching it after I've been involved as well. So it's been really quite a privilege. But I will also point beyond the Open Textbook Library and, and the issue of textbooks to this wonderful, wonderful uh, tool, search tool 
built by the folks at SUNY Geneseo. Uh, this effectively digs into many of the major repositories uh, for open textbooks and other kinds of open educational resources. And so it allows you to, to, to avoid having to actually visit too many web websites to look for all of the available OER. So uh, if, you're, if you're an educator attending this talk and you're interested in where do I get started? How can I possibly find something that's relevant? This is one of the places I would bookmark along with the open textbook library, certainly. But of course, uh, one of the things that should go without saying at this point, but I'll still say it, is even as you're interested in looking at these things, uh, believe me, your local textbook affordability librarian in Nancy, or certainly uh, your local librarian who may be an open education librarian, or, or even a, 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 you know, a, a liaison librarian, uh, would likely be delighted to, to help you uh, conduct that search. Now, I do want to talk about the impact beyond cost savings over here as well. And so, again, like I say, I speak from experience over here, certainly as, a, as an author, but also in terms of uh, being a researcher. Uh, this is one example of the, of the studies that I ran. This was a Canadian open textbook efficacy study uh, that found what many of the, the other studies in this space have typically found, which is typically there's really not much of a difference at all when it comes to student performance, uh, if you're looking at the use of OER versus uh, commercial textbooks. But often where there is a difference, it actually favors the free and open courses rather than the expensive commercial textbook uh, adoption courses as well. Uh, but don't look at my work as much as look at larger scale work. Um, like this, for example, this was a really impressive study uh, coming out of the state of Georgia just before the pandemic. Uh, and as you can see over here, uh, it's looking at the impact of OER and on a variety of student success metrics. And I'm quoting over here from, from the abstract, which again, encapsulates that typical finding. On the one hand, you do find, again, that OER improves end of course grades. It decreases DFW rates for all students. And for those of you unfamiliar with that, that's uh, often a term used in student success uh, metrics. Uh, it's, a, it's an aggregate measure of the percentage of students who've earned a D and F or who have withdrawn from the course. So it's really a, an aggregate measure of suboptimal outcomes of various stripes. So that happens in general. But the use of OER also improves course grades at greater rates, and it decreases DFW rates at greater rates for Pell recipient students, part-time students, and populations historically underserved by higher education. And I think this, for me, is one of the big reasons why I'm so drawn to, to supporting open education within higher education. It is just as the very same students who are typically marginalized by way of economics or their backgrounds within higher education. Those are the ones who I showed you earlier Florida textbook survey are typically suffering at the hands of high textbook costs. They are the ones who are disproportionately benefiting, right? So the benefits of OER disproportionately accrue in favor of those same students, which is why for me, it's such a powerful intervention. And as I said, things have changed and they continue to change. One of the reports I'd love to point out over here is the excellent work of uh, Julia and Jeff Seaman uh, and this study, which was, uh, or this survey, which was published uh, in 2023. The survey itself was actually conducted in April of 2023, so just under a year ago. Uh, about 2,500 faculty members and about 641 administrators, but the respondents came from all 50 states as well as DC. And the data from this report came from survey results using a nationally representative sample of teaching faculty. And so I'll show you over here what some of it, some of it, um, tells us, on the one hand, you can see the steady increase in faculty awareness by year, just about what is OER? I mean, I remember doing this work 10 years ago and many people would look at me with a, with a strange look, right? What do you mean by OER? And of course, we still have a way to go, but it's really, really changed to the point where, like further, as of 2022, 2023, as an academic year, about one in two faculty members in North America are using, or at least in the United States, are using OER in some way. It could be a supplementary or required, right? It could be in one course, maybe not all, but that's about half. And one in three require OER in at least one of their courses, right? So it's not supplementary, it's not optional. It's actually required in a core way. This is quite dramatic. And there are many things that have changed this landscape along the way. Of course, the pandemic provided another assist, certainly in terms of attention to who was being left out by traditional campus supports, no doubt. The hard work of librarians uh, plays a huge role. And of course, there have been major state initiatives. So in the state of Colorado, for example, I do want to tip my hat to the 
great assist provided by, by the state of Colorado, right? So both in terms of this Senate bill in 2017 that, that made an appropriation to kickstart some of this work, uh, as well as this House bill in 2018 that actually helped create the Colorado OER Council, uh, kickstarting grant, grant programs as well and, and continuing support for this. And I know the University of Northern Colorado has really benefited from this greatly, um, and certainly other institutions in, in the state have, have as well. But of course, it's a joy to see this. Right? It, UNC has been running a tremendous uh, grant program. And at this point, about 74 uh, instructors and faculty members have received OER grants. Uh, it's really, really impressive to see what they've actually done. But 71 courses have been converted to incorporate OER, and 29 different departments have, have benefited in turn, right? And with so many champions, of course, uh, it's hard to have, sort of have uh, all of them in front of you, but I did want to at least show you a quick representation of some of the incredible faculty champions when it comes to OER at UNC. So. Uh, from left to right, starting on the top row, I'm gonna call out Oscar Levin from Mathematical Sciences, Bailey Peterson from Philosophy, Ryan Darling from Psychological Sciences, my home discipline, thank you. Um, we have Mike Aldrich from Nursing, He Sung Lee from Music, Dalong Ma from Management. Uh, and of course, along with all of them, I do want to also shout out uh, the incredible helpers and builders along the way. And so Kathy Zellers, the Director of Instructional Design and Development, and of course, Nancy, who kicked off today's session as well, is of course UNC's Textbook Affordability Librarian, and both uh, Kathy and Nancy are members of the AOER committee. And it's because of their support, and in turn the state support, that UNC has been able to publish OER and books like this. Discrete Mathematics, uh, Open Listener in terms of American music, leadership and practice when it comes to nursing. This is fantastic work, right? So this is not happening somewhere else. This is happening on your campus. Your, your colleagues are availing of the support. It is doable and it's happening uh, you know, with the resources and expertise within your own institution. And if you're joining us, as many of you are from other institutions further afield, they should also tell you that your institution is able to develop and build some of these supports as well. It can be done in-house and it makes a great difference when you can build that internal capacity. We'll talk about that a, a bit along the way. But beyond the grant program, beyond supporting the publication of these resources, UNC has also done a terrific uh, uh, thing by, by integrating the discoverability of courses that are utilizing OER in the timetable when students register for courses. Right, as you can see, there's a beautiful video that shows students, uh, gives them a bit of a walkthrough how, how, how to do this. This is again, one of those critical pieces. And from my experience at my former institution where we were building zero textbook cost programs, I will tell you that this is actually one of the most powerful uh, things you can do. Because on the one hand, you're not leaving it to chance, right? It's not a happy accident anymore that a student walks into a course and says, oh, I'm gonna save money, I didn't realize. They don't have to go to the bookstore, right? They can see before they register if this is really critical to them where they can actually enroll in a section of a course that doesn't have textbook costs. It's a game changer for students, but it's also a game changer for evaluation, right? And so from a researcher's perspective, you can then actually look at data in the student information system and slice and dice it to see what is the difference in enrollment? What is the difference in withdrawal rate? What is the difference in student course performance for courses that utilize OER or don't use, utilize OER? So it's really quite a game changer. And there's a wonderful guide, by the way, uh, uh, published about marking OER courses that I'll try to share in the chat later if Nancy doesn't get to it before me, uh, that, that can teach you how to do this within your own institution, despite whatever your SIS happens to be. And so I mentioned this in terms of evaluation. This is certainly what we did at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, where I used to work uh, prior to 2022. Uh, and so this is the kind of data that we were, we were able to gain, right? So you're, you're seeing over here at KPU, uh, the, the gain when it came to DFW rates, that same metric that the folks in Georgia were looking at, right? So there were 4% fewer students either earning a D or an F or withdrawing from the course, They're performing better or they're staying in. And even courses were filling at higher rates. Uh, so you can talk about the tuition impact on the institution if you really want, uh, but the fill rates, right? Everything from uh, students entering the course, students staying in the course, and then in fact, performing better. Uh, you see the entire impact on the student journey through the use of OER. And of course, I'm talking about this as though this is only happening elsewhere. Uh, again, wanna, uh, wanna applaud the work of Jennifer May over here, uh, who of course is not just a member, but in fact, the chair of the AOER committee uh, at UNC. And I recommend that you read this fantastic report that is published, uh, this article that was published. Uh, and there's a few things uh, that are takeaways over here. One of which is in fact, like just at most, uh, just at most cases, 
um, the the passing rate for OER courses was higher as per Jennifer's research compared to courses not utilizing OER at the University of Northern Colorado, 7% higher in fact. And I should say this study includes data from, you know, over six and a half thousand students uh, over, uh, you know, between the fall of 2019 and the summer of 2021. Um, importantly, once again, the same point will be made. Uh, this gain is a general gain, but this gain was higher for first gen students higher for Pell eligible students and higher for underrepresented minority students. So that's passing. You can also look at completion, which bumped up 10%. And once again, that percentage was higher for first gen Pell grant eligible and underrepresented minority students. So once again, you're seeing the power of, of OERs and intervention in a way that disproportionately benefits those who most need this kind of support. So there's a lot that I think UNC is doing really well. And in fact, uh, that can serve as a model for many other institutions as well. It's incredible work and it needs to continue. These are still early days. And so, uh, you know, I would encourage you, at, whether at UNC or elsewhere, to also think about broader forms of institutional support. So in some cases, this might involve policy. So here's an example of what I mean. As an academic administrator, I'm often thinking about what can we change within the system so people who want to do right by students are not swimming upstream. Here's an example. You could look at your IP policy, as we did at Quantum Polytechnic University, encouraging not just the creation and adaptation of OER, but also publishing open access journals, also adopting open science practices, right? Openness across the board serves access, it serves equity, it serves transparency, and that actually improves quality in many, many cases. You could look at a curricular policy. Here's an example of one that, that we passed through our Senate at KPU, which involved uh, every new course that was developed or every course that was coming up for review, which happened about every five years, now has to undergo a search for relevant OER. Now, I want to be clear, this is not some, you know, top-down mandate to adopt OER, right? Faculty uh, have academic freedom. They are and they should remain the only people who make that call about what's appropriate for their courses. What this was, was a mandated search to make sure it's an informed decision, right? You have people sending you these expensive wares um, unsolicited in terms of expensive commercial textbooks. Nobody's doing that with OER. So what we want to make sure is that faculty are aware of all the available OER, uh, look at them, and then they could look at it and say, well, there's nothing available, or there is something available, but it's not good enough from my perspective. It's not a good fit. That's fine. That's their call. But the, but the library was going to support every faculty member going through that process of developing or reviewing a course. And that's the kind of systemic nudge that can really change the landscape. Right. That means within five years, every single course at the institution underwent a search for OER. That's powerful. Right. You can also look, and I will say this is another important piece for, for educators, at tenure and promotion policies. And so I'm going to give you a couple of examples over here. First, maybe at the bottom, the University of British Columbia, the big sort of R1 institution in, in uh, on the west coast of Canada, uh, includes the or recognizes the creation of OER as part of educational leadership. Uh, in the tenure and promotion process. And of course, Brock University, where I am right now, uh, uh, considers the development of OER when it comes to evidence used to demonstrate the quality and effectiveness of teaching. Either way, I mean, these are really, really powerful levers, right? There's many reasons why we do this work and recognition is not necessarily top of the list, but it is important to try and find ways to align these incentives to make it, as I said, so that educators who care passionately about widening equitable access are not swimming upstream over here. It needs to be recognized. So this is sort of fresh off the press, as you will. We're releasing this uh, softly today, and then in the coming weeks, you'll hear more about this. But I wanted to share a tool that, we're, that, uh, that we've developed as part of a research project in the province of Ontario. Uh, we're calling it the ISAT2 because it's really the second version of an institutional self-assessment tool that may be used by post-secondary institutions anywhere to self-assess their capacity to support open educational practices or even just assess the maturity of their open education initiatives. Uh, it's openly licensed as a tool. It's available in English and in French as that's how we roll in Canada, of course. Uh, but of course, it is uh, available to you publicly. So if anyone's interested in popping in now, it's available anonymously. And if you complete it, you will get a sense of the different dimensions and the, and the levels. You will get an automated email with a copy of your responses that you can then use to consider your next steps. Um, so I do think there are a few things you might consider right from internal and external partnerships, whether it's with the student association or the campus store or the registrar's office. Uh, you might look at incentive alignment. And I said tenure and promotion, but there's many, many other examples of this. 
Professional development for educators, of course, is critical, not just for OER, but also for what we will talk about next, which is open pedagogy. Uh, we'll talk about curricular integration, evaluation, and much, much more. And of course, all of this aligns with UNC's strategic plan, your values, your priorities. Right? Even if you just look at the first element of students first, that includes, if you read the details of that strat plan, it talks about things like equal opportunity being afforded, teaching and learning flourishing, diversity of thought and culture flourishing, and eliminating systemic barriers and institutional barriers to student progress. Right? But of course, it goes beyond students first. You can talk about inclusivity as well, because open education is not value neutral. Your university certainly isn't either. And so it is important to understand that while cost savings, affordability, and access are important, they are really just the beginning of what is possible with open educational practices writ large. So I want to call attention to a work of scholarship exemplary, really, by Sarah Lambert, uh, out of Deakin University in Australia, wrote this important article pointing to the deeper levels uh, which you can go to when it comes to serving justice with OER, certainly. So she talks about redistributive justice, for example, and this is what many of us think of when we think about adopting OER. Right. You would adopt OER, maybe it's a good fit, fantastic, maybe you get a grant to adapt it, excellent. You're saving your students money, what you're really doing is serving redistributive justice in many ways, right? This is the allocation of material or resources towards those who by circumstance have less. Fantastic. But you can go further. You can also look at recognitive justice, which is recognition and respect for cultural and gender difference. So you can think about, as this chart shows you, sociocultural diversity of the open curriculum. I'll give you an example of what I mean over here. Uh, here's an example of a fantastic project uh, published in, in a study, as you can see, talking about uh, textbooks that teach the history of psychology and how many of psychology's hidden figures were actually invisibilized in these history textbooks. But the faculty authors over here were able to take advantage of open licensing to, in fact, make them visible. That's a way of using the permissions of open licensing to advance uh, what Lambert describes as recognitive justice. And then you can go further still. You can look at representational justice, which is about more than just diversity in the curriculum. It's about equitable representation. It's about political voice. Uh, so you can, for example, in, in involve students of color in co-constructing OER that's about students of color that are pushing back against the systemic academic gatekeeping that we often see in the academy as well. And so I want to point to, again, some lovely work over here by Amy Nussbaum, uh, who talked about this in this wonderful article about who gets to wield uh, this power, uh, who gets to actually produce OER, and we'll talk about that as well. And so this is why as we move to evaluation of efforts that may be nascent or even mature to institutions, uh, it used to be that we used to really focus mainly on things like cost and outcomes and use and perceptions of, of OER. Uh, but increasingly, even the research community in open education have come to realize that we actually need to foreground the question of justice, attending to it, and in fact, evaluating our progress towards it. Uh, and so again, Virginia clinton Lissell, is a real leader in the space, uh, along with Jasmine Roberts-Cruz and Lindy Gavouche, uh, published this fantastic framework for research in, in open education that I want to point to. And, it, and the acronym is SCOPE, but what it really means is that when you're evaluating progress with open education or the impact of this kind of work, you want to attend first social justice. And you can look at those different dimensions that I just outlined as well. You can certainly look at the cost. You can look at the outcomes, like the educational outcomes we've discussed, uh, DFW rates and the like. You can look at perceptions and you can look at engagement. You have a fuller sense of what uh, is possible with adopting certainly OER. But just as cost savings, as I said, is not the full measure of the impact of OER, OER, in turn, is not the only powerful example from the spectrum of open educational practices. And when I refer to this, I'm certainly referring to open pedagogy in particular. Now, open pedagogy is many things, and, and certainly uh, many people embrace open pedagogy without even knowing, being aware of, or using that term. But open pedagogy goes beyond the use of OER. It involves the embrace of broader open practices. Robin DeRosa, a dear colleague and collaborator of mine, and I think about OER as, as on the one hand, it's an access-oriented commitment, if you will, to learner-driven education, because it involves more than just access. It also talks about giving learners more agency in the context of their, of their learning experience. But open pedagogy is also the process of using tools for learning or even building architectures for learning that allow students to shape the public knowledge commons 
of which they are a part, of course. And so I know I'm talking in really lofty terms over here, so I'll try to illustrate this in a way that perhaps gives you a sense of what open pedagogy may be through relief. This is one of my favorite images. This comes from a French text published over 100 years ago, and the text depicts various scenarios of the future. Interestingly, this image is actually in the public domain, so this is technically OER as well. But this particular slide depicts the classroom of the future, or the classroom of the year 2000, so the recent past. And I'd love for you to study this image because, I mean, I find it hilarious on the one hand, but it's revealing, right? The ideology that's baked into this illustration. You think about who is permitted to be the educator in this classroom? Who is permitted to be the student? There's not a lot of diversity in the room, for example. And what about the pedagogy, right? You have this, this individual who seems to be feeding received wisdom that's been bound and published and feeding it into this electronic relay system that's somehow magically transmitting information into students' minds. There's no active learning, there's no peer collaboration, there's not even the name to take notes. And in case you're missing it, here's my mouse cursor. There's your graduate student teaching assistant on the right hand side doing a lot of the manual labor. Right? So it's easy to laugh at this. But at the same time, I think if we're honest with ourselves, is this really terribly different? If you think about large lecture halls at, at large universities, you think about 300, 400 students in a class, never really interacting directly with the professor. Being, being given multiple choice dominant exams, high stakes exams. Um, there's a lot of this kind of philosophy in education still today. And so this to me, that image that I just showed you, for me is many in many ways reminiscent of what Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator and philosopher, referred to as the banking concept of education. And in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Freire described that model about as, as turning students into containers to be filled by the teacher. The more completely she fills the receptacles, the better a teacher she is, he wrote. The more meekly the receptacles permit themselves to be filled, the better students they are. And so education thus becomes the act of depositing, in which the students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor. In the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift, he writes, bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. There's a lot going on over there, but it does challenge us, right? Even if you think about something as straightforward as the learning management system today, right? At Brock, for example, we use D2L's Brightspace. It's an important tool for communication, sharing resources, other things like that. And many of us who use the LMS to support teaching and learning, to provide that structure, right? We might, let's say we teach a course, maybe you will archive that, that, uh, that architecture because you want to reuse it in a future offering. But if you think about it, the one thing that we tend, typically tend to wipe from the, from the archive before we save it is any trace of student activity. It's really quite fascinating, right? All of that student labor effectively being indicated as not really having value beyond the student's personal learning. And that's what open pedagogy pushes back on in many ways. So open pedagogy, open pedagogy could be a whole lot of things. It could be co-constructing course policies with students. It could be looking at schedules of work with students. Uh, it could be looking at what topics are actually covering as well, not pretending that the learning outcomes for the course are not or should not be influenced by the people who are actually with you on the journey, for example. But very often, open pedagogy takes, the, takes a particular form when it comes to assessment. And it's the use of what are known as non-disposable or sometimes renewable assignments. And as this article uh, from the journal Psychology, Learning and Teaching points out, uh, open pedagogy, or in, in this way, with non-disposable assignments, typically you know, vary at least on three dimensions from traditional course assignments. On the one hand, they typically have a larger audience than the course instructor. Right? It might be public scholarship, for example. It could be the next cohort of students that is actually the recipient of the student labor, if it's like building a guide, let's say, or identifying bottleneck concepts. So larger audience. Uh, B, it has a longer life. It lives beyond the term, beyond the semester. It might live on, for example, if they're editing Wikipedia, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and of course, it has a greater impact. It, of course, serves as student learning and skill development, but it goes much, much beyond that. And so, as I said, Wikipedia is a really good example of this. And the work of the Wiki Education Foundation, uh, with supporting many instructors, uh, really hundreds of instructors, uh, with working with their students so that as part of their coursework, they're writing and edit editing articles in Wikipedia, right? You can look at the work of Amin Azam, for example, at the University of California, and his students in the medical school over there, writing and editing articles in for a variety of medical topics. And if you think about somebody who's preparing to be a GP, 
to ex you know, somebody walks into your clinic, you have to explain in a couple of minutes some comp complex medical concepts in lay terms. It's actually a terrific way to practice. It's also an amazing public service. And you think about the impact on students. When students see that their work is not just meaningless, that it's not just another hurdle over here, that it's authentic assessment, yes, and it has real tangible value to the real world. And you can see that in student testimonials from these kinds of projects, right? Knowing that the information presented is valuable to someone, freeing up information that's hidden behind paywalls, wanting to contribute to something long lasting, something bigger than myself. And of course, as an educator, you know, we may, as a scholar, we should, we should be thrilled on the one hand and humbled at the same time that whereas, you know, an article we may publish in a peer reviewed scholarly journal may be read by, you know, a couple of dozen people, typically, hopefully more, Articles that students may edit in Wikipedia will be read by thousands and millions, in fact. It's wonderful. So maybe we think about replacing the traditional research essay with something like a Wikipedia assignment. Maybe we think about replacing the traditional classroom presentation with the creation of instructional videos that students can create, like these students at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, right? Whose video on the science of persuasion is not just fantastic and openly licensed and living on YouTube today, but is now being used by other educators across the world to teach the science of persuasion, which is incredibly powerful for them. You could talk about educators working with students to annotate existing open textbooks. So here are a couple of screenshots over here from a social psychology course that I taught, and you can see one student of mine at the top is augmenting the example in the text to provide an illustration from her own life to illustrate a particular concept. And another at the bottom, sharing a, a resource or an example of a, of a video from uh, the show The Office to illustrate a particular concept. And again, when you're looking for cultural references, relatables, wondering about what resonates with students today, no, it ain't Seinfeld, but you don't even have to worry about what it is. Let the students do that. They're much better place to do it. And in doing so, they enriched the margins of the open textbook that I used for successive cohorts of students, right? So it's a very low threshold entry into open pedagogy, something like this, annotating resources and including open textbooks like this. Um, and the tool, by the way, I'm using is a wonderful open source tool called Hypothesis that integrates in many browsers. But you can go beyond annotating. Students can edit OER. I worked with uh, a faculty member who was teaching a course in economics where the theory of macroeconomics wasn't changing from one semester to the next, but the students were actually going in to Statistics Canada database and actually updating the charts every semester because the unemployment rate would change. And so they ex exercised their research skills, their graphical skills, but they were actually helping contribute to the book being more up to date than any potential commercial textbook could ever be. And students cannot do more than adapt and edit. They can actually write author OER. Fantastic example over here, and this is one of a series, several volumes now, Environmental Science Bites from students at the Ohio State University. Uh, again, edited by the faculty members in the program, terrific illustration of what's possible, right? So again, we're not just talking about access and, and, and cost savings and redistributive justice. We're going further over here by giving students a lot more agency in the context of open educational practices. And one of the reasons why I love open pedagogy is it doesn't just draw on open licensing, which is powerful by itself. It also very much, as you're probably seeing, uh, drawing on the tradition of critical pedagogy. And you may have already uh, uh, understood this from my references to Paolo Freire or indeed bell hooks at the start, uh, but Henry Giroux over here as well uh, uh, from McMaster University has written about how critical pedagogy asserts that students can engage their own learning from a position of agency, right? It takes seriously the educational imperative to encourage students to act on the knowledge, values, and social relations they acquire by being responsive to the deepest and most important problems of our times. And when I think about the deepest and most important problems of our times, of course, my mind, among other things, goes to those grand challenges facing humanity, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 of them, articulated by the United Nations and UNESCO in particular. And so again, I wanna to point to the wonderful work being done uh, at Montgomery College uh, in Maryland. Absolutely fantastic. It was a joy to join them for my former institution. So we made it so it was an international uh, inter-institutional initiative, but we built a fellowship for faculty members where we provided them with training and support to design these non-disposable renewable assignments. But beyond just being open pedagogy, it was designed so that students would work with the faculty members to create OER that would serve progress towards a specific sustainable development goal. So it's that direct connection in a way that's really clearly meaningful in a public sphere. 
And one of my favorite examples, and this I would say, I should say this fellowship has grown by leaps and bounds. Right? The Arizona Maricopa Community College System is a part of it. There's partners now in other continents as well. Uh, I recommend looking at this as well as a, as a really different way of engaging folks when it comes to innovative pedagogy that's meaningful and open. Uh, but my favorite example is at the bottom of this slide, where I had three faculty members, as you can see, one from Open Ecosystems, Sustainable Horticulture, and Anthropology, different institutions. And they worked with their students to create a scientific quality database, or at least add to one, actually, uh, that involved mapping all of the edible weeds on the different campuses of the different institutions. So it was a local focus on food insecurity in a way that connected with a, a grand uh, uh, challenge, one of the SDGs, but obviously involved the creation and publication of OER as well. Uh, and so I, I do want to share just a, a brief uh, uh, testimonial over here, but also a remarkable insight from one of the faculty members who I was working with. This is at my former institution, KPU, Jennifer Hardwick. And as you'll see, Jennifer is, is one of these people who, as an educator, she was a joy to work with, a, a joy to support, and certainly someone I admire greatly. Uh, but I'll let her speak for herself in articulating why she was particularly drawn to, to this form of open pedagogy. Because I've been using open pedagogy in my classes for the last five or six years, and I've used renewable assignments before and media assignments before, and I think they're very effective. I think they allow a kind of creativity and engagement that a lot of other assignments don't. And I am a writing instructor primarily. I'm interested in good communication, and I think that that communication should extend in the digital age to different kinds of assignments, different ways of employing rhetoric and uh, self-expression. And so this is a good opportunity to encourage students to think about those skills. I'm also interested in using open pedagogy because I want students to think deeply about it and I want them to think about access to information and uh, the ethics that guide that both the ethics of what we see now in education in terms of the high costs of textbooks and um, the inaccessibility of a lot of resources, but also on the other end, the way that the academy has been um, complicit in extracting knowledge and in um, monetizing knowledge uh, that doesn't necessarily belong to the people who are doing the extracting. And so I want students thinking carefully about the information that they gather and the information that they share. and. Um, how to do that in ethical ways. And I think that open assignments are a great way to introduce those conversations. Because I've been using open because of There we go. Um, as I said, uh, Jennifer is just an absolute superstar. And so I love to, to share her words directly. Uh, I do want to, as I'm illustrating these, you know, trying to provide some different examples for inspiration over here, I do want to point to a couple of resources. Um, for folks looking to dig deeper into what can open pedagogy look like in practice, what might it look like in my discipline at the assignment level, at the course level. One is the Open Pedagogy Notebook that Robin DeRosa and I created some years ago, uh, but we no longer actively add to this site. And so increasingly, even though there's a good set of resources over here, we're pointing people to the Open Pedagogy Portal, uh, which has been developed by the fine folks at the Open Education Network, which is a very large and expanding international consortium at this point of like-minded institutions. And so I recommend that you look over here, consider drawing inspiration, but also frankly, consider contributing to it as well. Uh, and then beyond these really well-known resources at this point, I, I do wanna highlight some of the wonderful work happening, of course, at UNC once again, including this wonderful resource developed by, by Michael Aldrich, tools to promote open pedagogy in the classroom, uh, available in, in UNC's uh, digital repository as well. Uh, really, really nice examples over there, really thoughtful. Uh, and again, congratulations to Michael and the AUAR committee for supporting this work. Uh, but I will say, lots of ways to get started, lots of places to draw inspiration from. Um, but like so many things, you know, I find when I'm working with open pedagogy, I think about the impact on my students. I think about what it does for students who feel like they are, have an active role in their education, like they, like, they, like they feel a sense of belonging, particularly when their identities are a little more recognized in the classroom as well. But I'm also sensitive to how much it changes you as an educator, right? It really, really does in many, many ways when you're doing this work. It, it really helps you to maybe, for me, it, it reconnected me with my values for why I got into this work in the, in the first place, right? I remember being an international student, as I said, uh, struggling with food insecurity. And I remember along the way being an adjunct faculty member working at three institutions trying to cobble together a full-time job without benefits and feeling excluded. So like, you hold on to those experiences and there's a way the academy has of, of sort of, you know, of creating a sense of, of, of 
almost dulling the, the, the sharpness of your values and what drew, drew you into this work. And for me, that reconnecting to those values in the first place is what, mean, what, is what means so much. It changed how I approach teaching and learning. And I think it does for others as well. Uh, so I have a, a second, this is my last uh, little faculty testimonial over here. Uh, and this one comes from uh, someone who, whose work I've only recently learned about and whose work I'm certainly going to follow moving forward. Uh, this is the phenomenal Bailey Peterson from UNC. Um, the most surprising thing or the biggest thing that kind of changed just from doing OER was realizing how much I wanted to also incorporate open pedagogy. So um, opportunities for students to learn from each other and even semester to semester. So I have some assignments um, that I wouldn't have come up with, I think, without kind of diving into OER. And it's actually made some of my teaching easier because I'm putting some of the work on student to student interaction. So just for example, I have like a living study guide and a living glossary every semester where students put up potential questions they think might be on the test and other students take a stab at answering them and then students will respond and say well i think you could add this to your answer or here's an example um and same with the glossary students will come up with a definition so oddly in some ways it's made my teaching easier because that's enabling them to kind of take that more active role and then i don't have to just reiterate a definition multiple times they can say hold on is it like this and then they kind of are working from each other. It's fantastic. And so maybe I'll just note that in my experience, supporting educators at a few different institutions in this kind of work, there are many people who come to open education for OER, for the cost savings. But there are many of those people who stay for the pedagogy, right? And you're seeing that with Bailey um, well. most. Whoops. Um, just a few other things uh, as, as I as I come to come close to my close over here. Um, you know, I will say, just as with OER, I said, I've, I've identified how you can go beyond designing learning experiences that are just engaging and effective to also designing learning environments that are truly just. Open educational practices like open pedagogy can also vary. They can be more instructor-centered or they can be more student-centered, right? They can be more content-centric or they can be more process-centric, which is perhaps even more important in the age of generative AI. And they can be primarily designed for pedagogical purposes or primarily designed for social justice. And those are the dimensions along which you see the difference between when open pedagogy has a neutral effect or sometimes even a negative effect, right? If you think about, are you compelling your students to perform public scholarship without adequately scaffolding their skill development, without understanding that the risks of open scholarship are unevenly distributed when, for example, minoritized students are disproportionately targeted in flame wars online? Open pedagogy can be ameliorative. You're having a positive impact, absolutely, like when you're creating and sharing OER for populations who wouldn't have access. But you can also design it intentionally so that it's actually truly transformative, where, as I said, you're involving students who may be minoritized, you're giving them voice, you're giving them a sense of belonging, uh, and you're really advancing not just redistributive justice in Sarah Lambert's uh, uh, article terminology, but also recognitive and, and representational justice at the same time. One of my favorite examples of those kinds of projects co comes from Kwantlen Polytechnic University, where a dear friend sadly passed, uh, uh, Arlie Crothers was an incredible uh, instructor in uh, applied communications. One of my favorite projects was working with her when uh, she gave her students agency in the choice of research topic. The students happened to pick, surprise, surprise, with all of the work we were doing, textbook affordability. So what they did is they, they ran a quantitative survey, they ran interviews and did qualitative research at the same time. They assembled a report, right, a research report that really looked at this. And it was based on survey data and interview data from students at the institution, particularly international students, uh, minoritized students as well. Now, what we did after that is they created, the students themselves, created a tabletop game, almost sort of inspired by, by Monopoly with sort of chance cards based on real life events, right? This actually happened to you. Somebody died in your family. You had to make a trip overseas. Uh, you dropped your phone and broke it. So real life events that, that caused, you know, you, you, you take the persona of a student and you try and navigate through the semester with some of these financial choices. And many of those choices, as you can see over here, had to do with what books they were going to buy, what books they could afford. Are they going to wait for the midterm exam to see if they're going to buy the book if they really need it or not? 
and it's available online. We've built it using Pressbooks, which is an open publishing uh, tool, as well as H5P. For those of you who are familiar, it's an interactive platform that's also openly licensed. Um, and it's available as, a, as an interactive simulation and, and really a, a faculty development tool at this point. And so I encourage you to look at this. It's not an easy game to play, but then it really isn't for students today either. So that's probably by design. Uh, but it was an incredible project. It drew on the real experiences, lived experiences of international students struggling with food insecurity. Um, you know, and, and of course, the use of OER in this course, she assigned, she authored a lot of OER, early did, uh, and assigned it to, to the learners. The use of OER saved them money, it advanced redistributive justice, but it was the embrace of open pedagogy in this thoughtful way that gave the students a voice, and in doing so, it also advanced representational justice. And as one of my favorite authors, Arundhati Roy, has said, there's really no such thing as the voiceless that are only the deliberately silenced or the preferably unheard. And so in thinking about that and in thinking about even the lessons of the pandemic, I do want to say that it is critically important that we design supports for OER, for open pedagogy in a way that is attentive to the experiences of folks at the margins, right? There's a reason why we want to make sure that accessibility is not an after afterthought that data privacy is not disregarded as we're sort of giddily trying to sample the new Gen AI platform, that we think about and plan for the real issue that is digital redlining, right? Where, again, along racial lines, access to even high-speed internet is quite different. And the digital divide is in fact reinforced along some of those lines. Uh, and so again, these are all issues to think about, and, and I'm happy to share this volume with you, Open at the Margins, which shares a, a range of more critical perspectives on open education because there are real challenges over here. And I think the pandemic would have shown many of us very clearly how the assumption that the digital is the solution is the kind of assumption that can actually exacerbate existing inequities instead of actually redressing them. And so particularly in the age of AI, what I would say is what I think we need to focus much more on critical uh, approaches to open education and certainly on humanizing uh, the teaching and learning experience. And so as I close, I will say, um, you know, designing for the margins should be top of the list, but we also need a more critical, a more inclusive, a more open approach, right? Leading with trust for students is certainly one. Not so much surveillance, not so much, uh, uh, you know, rigor in a way that's weaponized uh, in terms of high stakes assessments where students are chained to a desk with uh, eyeballs taped up and we're sort of doing retinal scans as they're engaging in, in anything that we might uh, consider to be academic integrity. No. I think we need to talk about rigor, rigor in terms of flexibility and accessibility. That's some of the work of Christina Katapodis. I think if we're going to talk about academic integrity, we need to talk about extending that concept to our own work, uh, our own approach to technology and pedagogy. So I think we need to lead with care. And I think we need to not forget about self-care. And so in doing that, building supports and structures that support humans and that foster humanity. I'll close with a couple of quotes over here, one of which comes from an amazing book, an inspirational book by Kevin Ganon, Radical Hope, a Teaching Manifesto, in which Kevin writes that the real work of change in higher education is done students by students, classroom by classroom, course by course, and it's done by educators who have committed to teaching because it and their students matter, right? In many ways, right, we need to save the soul of higher education, and we do it, as I said, by trusting educators, by trusting students, and building support so that that trust, that care, that kind of leadership isn't swimming against the current. In other words, to close with bell hooks, to teach in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students is essential if we are to provide the necessary conditions where learning can most deeply and intimately begin. This is the slide that was, or the image that was lurking behind my title slide at, at the start of this talk. And I'm imagining not many of you attended to it, but I will share that this is a photograph I took when I was visiting South Africa for the first time. And what you're seeing across the water over there is Cape Town, Table Mountain above it. And I'm obviously not there. I was across the water on Robben Island. And Robben Island, from you know, many of you will know this, was a maximum security political prison for, for prisoners for a long time. It's where Nelson Mandela spent 18 years of his prison sentence, for example. And at the time, you know, this was incredible because all of the tour guides when I when I visited were still former inmates uh, from, from the prison. And I'm sharing this with you because 
that as an educational experience for me was transformative. It remains with me to this day. And that's the case because for me, education at its finest is democratizing. It is liberatory. It is anti-racist. It is decolonizing, right? It is critical. It is inclusive. And it certainly is open. I really appreciate everybody sticking with me through, through this presentation. And I can't wait to see what your questions are or your comments. But thanks very much, folks. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, um, we're gonna go to the Q questions in the Q and A. Um, I think Melinda's gonna read the first one. Um, we currently only have one, but I guarantee you there are other people who are participating who have thoughts and questions. So please enter those into the Q and A so that we can um, have Dr. John Gianji attend to them. So Melinda, would you um, get us started, please? Most definitely. All right, so our first question, so it says, um, our college has a textbook rental program and as publishers um, have picked up our rental model, they're pushing our faculty toward access codes to the point that our students are now paying over half a million dollars in codes this year. Do you have any suggestions for educating faculty on this so they can make more informed textbook purchasing decisions? Yeah, this is a really hard thing. I mean, I think there's some practical strategies I would suggest certainly, but you know, I, I will not ignore the fact that there's a reason why the publishers have had the success that they have. And part of it is the marketing machine, right? I worked at one point in a department where it was not unusual for the textbook rep or the publisher rep to come in and say, well, if you adopt this book for this course for this length of time, we're going to sponsor these conferences. We're going to give you this money in exchange. So please be aware that that's a real thing. This is not a neutral landscape. Um, there's also the practical matter of how these decisions are made. Sometimes the choice of what book or what model is being adopted is not the choice of individual faculty members, right? In some departments, it's a committee that makes the decision, for example. So what I would suggest is, you know, if we are educators and we care about science for, for matter, I, I would suggest doing some research, right? Certainly try to raise awareness, talk about this, look at the research reports that are out there, learn from the experiences, the painful experiences of those who've gone down some of these paths before uh, and why they've certainly uh, pivoted away from those kinds of models. Um, you know, you think about the, the funneling of public education into student loans, which then goes to, goes to, to you know, commercial publishers through, through deals like this. But I would say, you know, as a faculty member, and I am still a faculty member, uh, I would say, you know, I'm concerned about the erosion of academic freedom because often you are limited to things like a, a particular uh, publisher's platform and choosing titles from there. I'm interested in accessibility and the work that ought to be done for books to be accessible that are being uh, done to instead retrofit inaccessible books. I'm interested in taking a fraction of that investment from the institution and investing it in building robust, open community owned, supportive, inclusive infrastructure. It would take a fraction of that to, to make your uh, open program really fly. But I think, you know, the fact that you already know how much is being spent over here is I think a good start. But I would look at, uh, as I said, the experiences of others. You don't have to figure this out by yourself. Reach out to Spark. They have a wonderful set of resources, research and database that, that you can get some assistance with. Um, look at doing some actual research, look at student outcomes. I, I guess what I would say, just to back up over here, is whether it's a textbook rental program or whether it's inclusive access, right? I know many people are familiar with the traditional commercial textbook approach. And it's because it's familiar that the natural inclination on the part of many educators is, what is this newfangled OER thing? Let's rigorously evaluate that before I consider adopting that. No, 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 no. It's the other way around. If you're going to ask students to spend money to access resources, that is the approach that should be rigorously evaluated to understand that there's a solid basis on which you can say, yes, I've thought about this and there's a good reason why I'm asking you to spend this money. Not there's a good reason why uh, I, I think I need to be persuaded to not ask you to spend money, right? So I think we do need to turn the tables over here. But so shifting assumptions, talking to faculty, uh, you know, even if it's your faculty association about the agency that faculty may be being stripped off over here, thinking about accessibility and course formats, certainly looking at research and support that's available uh, from other places like Spark, uh, and then just doing some evaluation as well. I mean, so there's some strategies over there, but you're certainly not alone over here. Let's see. Well, I actually 
I don't, as, as long as I'm not misunderstanding the Q&A feature, it looks like we have, um, we don't have any in there right now, but um, I actually have, um, I have a question. I'm curious about when in conversations about equitable access and inclusive access, um, I feel like I hear less about data privacy issues than I may, I maybe feel like I should. Um and I don't know, I was just curious what your thoughts on that are because of the, um, you know, publisher platforms that are that are harvesting student data for the sake of all the things that people harvest student data for. But I hear that, I feel like I hear that less in arguments against those um, models. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. I realize I muted myself over there. Uh, I was just trying to bring up something as you were asking the question, and I found it quickly, and I'm going to put it in the chat as well. There's a few people who've been digging into this question, um, and I want to point to this article in the Chronicle from last year, last July, uh, that cites some of the work, uh, and apologies, it is behind a registration wall, even if it's not a paywall, uh, but it, it really talks in great detail about the work, uh, including of Billy Meinke at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, it is quite impressive when you look at what is being handed over to these third parties, particularly when a tool is being adopted at the course level, not even at the institutional level where it may have gone through. Like in Canada, we do a privacy impact assessment and a few other interrogations before we had procure and adopt uh, technology at the institutions. Um, but I think there are several issues over here as well. Um, let's see if I can bring up one other piece. Um, I think it'll take me a minute to, to come up with it. Um, but I don't think you're wrong. Um, I think one of the challenges of this work is uh, increasingly, um, you know, when I when we're publishing open work, we, we often encounter this, this question as well. I know working with BC campus on the West Coast when they were publishing work a long time ago, on the one hand, you're publishing openly, you wanna see what impact it has. Do you wanna add those Google Analytics, those trackers to see which countries, where are the users, uh, what kind of devices they, are they using, those kinds of things. On the other hand, you wanna think about are you collecting information for the sake of collecting information? Are you? Do you want to do this? Is this serving a purpose? So there's data ethics alongside that conversation around around privacy. Um, you know, not assuming that students have the kind of literacy, especially the most 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 marginalized students, uh, in in making those kinds of choices on on their behalf. Um, and so, I, I do think it behooves us to to interrogate this more deeply. Um, one of the things we have looked at at my current institution, we've just um, adopted a new academic plan. Uh, and this is happening at the province uh, of British Columbia as well. We're developing a framework for ethical educational technology. And so ideally this is something that even intervenes in the procurement process where you know, it's not just that a tool uh, you know, meets legislative requirements for privacy uh, and that we can budget for it and we can support it. It actually has to be evaluated on its ethical and pedagogical dimensions. And by that measure, tools like, you know, uh, educational technology or uh, surveillance educational technology, whether it's remote exam proctoring, whether it's AI detection tools, would also have to pass a, a sniff test and, and more than a sniff test, a real thorough interrogation, uh, right? Um, in the article I've, I've put in the chat, for example, that identified instances of student data sharing that actually conflicted with, or at least raised questions about, uh, the practices related in publishers' privacy notices. Uh, and in the case, and I'm just going to quote from the article over here, in the case of Pearson's popular MyLab platform, uh, right, personally identifiable information such as a student's name, email address, was sent to, sent to Google Analytics, along with notifications of what the student was reading and highlighting in the ebook. Uh, so that's just one example, um, but it's certainly not, not the only one. So, you know, as I said, in the age of Gen AI, there's a few things to worry about. Data privacy is part of that. Uh, and then alongside that will be the question of student intellectual property as well. So um, I think all of this uh, is important to attend to uh, in the realm of ethical ed tech. Um, and maybe the last plug I'll make over here is uh, there was a book published very, very recently. It's a remarkable volume. Uh, it's called Higher Education for Good. Um, and I think it's 
it may be the last chapter in the book, I can't recall, uh, but it, it's it's a chapter that's called Who Cares About Procurement? Uh, and I say this because, you know, as an academic administrator, I work with my procurement department quite a lot. Those are the folks who many faculty members will never see, but obviously they, they attend to anything that is purchased or, or contracted on behalf of the institution. Uh, and they make some excellent, very practical suggestions about how we need to shift that process uh, to again ensure that, you know, we're not like Silicon Valley. We can't simply, you know, come up with a new product uh, it might have some some irreparable harm and we just, you know, collapse and start again, uh, right? We're not a commercial textbook publisher, a publisher that's beholden to shareholders. We need to put the learners at the center of the experience, but we need to attend to those who are going to be most harmed by a particular technology and evaluate it on that basis, right? It's not, you know, do no harm is an incredibly low barrier. Um, and I'm not sure it's been comfortably cleared at this point. So I, I appreciate you raising the question. And I think for me, this is one of the main reasons why I believe so strongly in building open community-owned infrastructure. And so that's why you look at, you know, I can look at tech tools like Hypothesis, for example. Yes, you can work with Hypothesis as a vendor. Absolutely. They have a business model, no doubt. But their code is on GitHub. You can use them open source. You can control the data. You don't have to have any transfer to a third party. There's a whole host of things you can do with open source technologies that follow the ethos of learners first and inclusion. And I think for me, that's part of the lesson over here um, uh, as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's something to think about. Um, we have a few minutes. Are there any other uh, questions or thoughts that we have for our speaker? Well, there are always, as I said at the beginning, always many demands on people's time. So very grateful for the people who attended. Um, everyone who registered will get the video. And um, I have some of my own notes, but one of the one of my takeaways um, of many is I one of the things you said at the end, leading with trust for students and beginning with that in mind, which I think is quite lovely. So thank you to Dr. Janjiani. Thank you to um, Melinda and RIT and all the attendees. Um, we're glad you were here and uh, happy open education week thank you very much everybody it was a privilege wishing everybody a wonderful week as well thank you bye-bye